Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all-new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected, like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. By October 2011, three months had passed since 32-year-old Rebecca Zahau's tragic and bizarre death. Three months had passed since Rebecca was found dead, naked, and dangling from a noose off the balcony of her boyfriend's extravagant California beachfront mansion. Three months had passed since the police had ruled her death a suicide. And in that time, the little boy who was gravely injured on Rebecca's watch, her boyfriend Jonah's six-year-old son Max, had also died from injuries he sustained after a deadly fall. A fall that happened when Rebecca was the adult left in charge of keeping him safe. Rebecca's family had held a funeral and they had buried the beautiful young brunette they called Becky. But that funeral did not do what we always hope they do. It had brought them no closure. You know, closure is a funny word. I think it's overused in these situations, but it is intended to describe a feeling where you can close the book on your feelings, close the book on your raw pain, and at least put the book on the shelf. It doesn't mean that you don't get it down and read from it. It doesn't mean that you don't forget that person. But it at least means that you have answers. You have some explanation. You've made some sense out of the tragedy So the insanity of it all doesn't keep you awake at night. There's some order to the universe where you have made this, at least in your world, serve some purpose. And the funeral is kind of a rite of passage. It's kind of an event where you honor that person and it begins a new era without them. That funeral did none of those things for the Zahau family because they walked into that funeral with burning questions and they walked out of that funeral with burning questions. Why was Rebecca, a young woman who they say had been so full of life, dead so long before her time? Green Chef is the first USDA certified organic meal kit company. Green Chef is now owned by HelloFresh and with a wider array of meal plans to choose from. Love switching it up? Now you can enjoy both brands at a discount with me. Choosing Green Chef means choosing real foods that support a healthy lifestyle. You can count on meals that are good for your body. Green Chef offers unique farm fresh ingredients and premium proteins. The beef tenderloin with tomato shallot sauce. Now this is a restaurant worthy meal that's guaranteed to wow. The paleo friendly meal is fantastic and simple to make. Robin and I have fun creating Green Chef meals. It fits perfectly with our diet and lifestyle. So go to greenchef.com slash 60 mystery and use code 60 mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. That's greenchef.com slash 60 mystery and use code 60 mystery to get 60% off plus 20% off your next two months. The number one meal kit for eating well. Brooks Running has a new shoe for you runners out there. Did you hear that? Better turn up your volume. In fact, turn it up to the max. Introducing the all new Ghost Max. It's got all kinds of things to make your knees and ankles feel protected like Max Cushion, Max Soft Landings with DNA Loft V2 Foam, and Max Smooth Rides with their Glide Roll Rocker. Feel better on your run with Ghost Max. Learn more at brooksrunning.com. Even though Rebecca was laid to rest, her family could not rest. They refused to close that book and put it on the shelf. They refused to say, okay, this was God's plan. They refused to accept that Rebecca's death was a suicide. They said they knew her, and she just would not do that. They told me that she committed suicide by hanging. I just lost it. My sister is not the type of person to commit suicide. I truly believe it's a murder. 
they said this was not in any way the order of how things were supposed to happen. And of course, parents are not meant to bury their children. It's the other way around. Children are meant to bury their parents. So anytime a parent faces the challenge of burying their children, it's very unsettling and very hard for parents to wrap their minds around, and that's exactly what was happening with the Zahau family. It has been said that it is the duty of the living to find justice for the dead. Rebecca's family vowed to dedicate their lives to proving their belief that Rebecca didn't take her own life. She was murdered in cold blood, according to them. Now, because of everything I've just described, you can understand why they would want to prove that something else had happened, because If they accept that she had taken her own life, as I said earlier, it's kind of an admission of failure. It's kind of an admission of failing to see red flags. It's kind of an admission of failing to fill voids in their daughter's life. It's having to own being less than she needed to be inspired to live. So you can understand how someone would want desperately to find an alternative explanation. But was it more than that? Was it more than them just wanting to escape ownership and accountability? Was there really an alternative explanation? They raised money to hire their own investigators, and then they decided their next move had to be drastic. They did not want to accept what the San Diego coroner had determined as fact. And they felt that in order to get the answers they so desperately wanted, they had no choice but to have Rebecca's body re-examined. That's when they made the incredibly difficult decision to raise Rebecca from her grave and have a second autopsy performed. Now think about that for just a moment before we hear Mary talk about this. You've gone through this rite of passage. You've gone through the pain of the funeral. You have stood by the graveside. You have buried your loved one. You have covered that casket with dirt you have closed that chapter and you have walked away. Think in your mind what it takes to say, I'm going to undo every bit of that. I am going to raise her from that grave. I am going to subject her body to further dissection. I am going to subject her body to further testing. I am going to undo what closure I have done. This is a big decision. Listen to Mary talk about that decision. I feel like my sister hasn't rested yet because I don't have an answer for her as far as what happened to her. We believe that there were more things that were overlooked, and we believe that we would find out more things that weren't mentioned to us or even looked into. Three months after she was found dead, three months after her funeral, three months after that coffin was lowered into the ground in a gravestone reading, springtime beauty granddaughter, daughter, sister, and favorite aunt was put in place. Rebecca's body was risen from its grave. Rebecca was removed from what was supposed to be her final resting place in Missouri and flown all the way to Philadelphia, where a famed pathologist was waiting to conduct a second autopsy, and he was ready to take a closer look at Rebecca's injuries and what they could mean. Could injuries to her head and back finally prove what really happened to Rebecca on that summer night in the ocean side of Coronado, California? What did the second autopsy show? Did it point to murder? Plus, Rebecca's family says she had no history of mental illness or depression and was planning for the future. They say there were no signs she was suicidal. We talk about this so much that it almost loses its meaning. But again, think about where you are psychologically right now. It is a monumental decision to decide to kill oneself. Think about how far you would have to depart from your current position to get to the point where you decide you are going to end your life. There are no more tomorrows. There's no more hope. There's no more seeing your mother or father, your sisters or brothers, children if you have them. 
There's no more accomplishments. There's no more hope for achievement. It's all going to end in a matter of a split second. There's a big difference between suicidal ideation and suicidal action. A whole lot more people think about it than those who do it. And taking that final step of actually ending your life is a really big step. And to appreciate how big that step is, think about what would have to happen, how far you would have to move from where you are now to make that decision in your own life. We have to appreciate the gravity of what would move someone to do this. Maybe you are one of those people. Maybe you're answering that question by saying, you know, Dr. Phil, how far would I have to move? Not very far. Maybe you're living in the ends of the continuum. Maybe you're thinking actively about taking your life. If that's true, you really need to not just think this through, you need to talk it through with someone. And you do that by calling the suicide hotline, talking to someone that you love, talking to the pastor at your church, seeing a therapist. And let me dispel a myth that I think is really important here. When you call the suicide hotline, they're not going to make you give your name. They're not going to pressure you. They're going to listen. They're going to ask you questions. But they're not going to make you do anything. They're not going to come crashing through your door. You do have anonymity. So you can call without fear of being outed. But I encourage you to do that because let me tell you, you don't have to be in a hurry. Suicide might seem like it's going to solve your problems, but I can assure you it has really bad side effects because it is forever. I'm making a point here that this is a big deal in Rebecca's life. And if you're thinking about it, it's a big deal in your life. So don't just think it through, talk it through. And by the way, if you want to do that, if you want to talk, you should contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And that number is 1-800-273-8255. That's 1-800-273-TALK. So were there warning signs that had been ignored? Police say they found secret notes written by Rebecca. Was there something darker brewing below the surface of Rebecca's seemingly picture-perfect life that her family just didn't see? Was she so unhappy that she didn't want to live? Did she feel trapped? Was she so unhappy she was preparing to leave Jonah? And could she have decided that suicide was the easiest way? And then there was a large knife with Rebecca's blood on it found in the mansion bedroom. It wasn't used to cut the rope used to hang Rebecca, and she had no cuts on her body, so where did the blood come from? Could the answer to that question be proof of an attack and point to a killer? This is episode four of Mansion of Secrets, the mysterious death of Rebecca Zahal. Rebecca's first autopsy was conducted shortly after her death by Dr. Jonathan Lucas, the San Diego chief medical examiner, and he ruled Rebecca's death a suicide. Our office concluded that the cause of death was hanging and the manner of death was suicide. Dr. Lucas stated there was no evidence of a struggle and after examining Rebecca's body, he believed she was alive when her body went over the mansion's balcony railing. While Dr. Lucas acknowledged that seeing a suicidal person tie themselves up the way it appeared Rebecca had, with her feet bound and her hands tied behind her back with knotted rope, was very rare, he said it does sometimes happen with suicidal people who want to die. They do things to make sure their suicide is fail-safe essentially so they can't change their minds midway through and try to save themselves. This is consistent with what I said earlier. This is a big decision, and sometimes people want to back out. And what Dr. Lucas is saying is that people do put in mechanisms to close off any exit corridors so they can't change their minds. But Rebecca's family just never bought any of that. And in the beginning, they weren't the only ones fighting for answers. Jonah Shacknai now accepts that his girlfriend's tragic death was a suicide. But in September 2011, he wrote a desperate letter to the California Attorney General. 
He asked them to get involved and review the San Diego officials' findings on Rebecca's death. Jonah said he needed answers so he could bring peace to his family, specifically his other children and his ex-wife, Max's mom, Dina. Jonah said it was intolerable to sit back and watch his family tormented by unfounded rumors and accusations. He too wanted answers once and for all, but the Attorney General's office declined to review the findings. They stated that just because there was excessive speculation about a case, that did not require them getting involved with a local investigation. Well, Rebecca's family wasn't deterred. They weren't going to give up so easily. They had seen the famed and well-respected pathologist, Dr. Sarah Wecht, commenting on Rebecca's case in the media. Now, you have to remember, this case was all over the news, and even though police ruled it a suicide and closed the book on it, people were still fascinated with the idea that a young and beautiful woman who seemingly, seemingly had it all, would kill herself, especially in such a bizarre way. And by bizarre way, I mean nude, outside and on display, and by hanging which is uncommon for women, not to mention hands and feet bound, hands bound behind her back. Many news outlets were dedicating their lead story to the question on many people's minds. Could this have been a murder, staged to look like a suicide? Was Rebecca left hanging with a cryptic note painted on the door so that it would look like she killed herself in a fit of grief? Was this all a setup to cover up a killer's tracks? So in September, world-noted and widely respected pathologist Dr. Sarah Wecht was booked and interviewed by a local San Diego news station and asked to give his expert opinion on Rebecca's autopsy. At this point, he was not involved in the case. The news station just asked Dr. Wecht to read and review Rebecca's autopsy, the one that had been performed by Dr. Jonathan Lucas. They wanted him to discuss his own opinion of what he thought may have happened. Now, that's something really common that we do in the TV business. We want to dig deeper into a case or a mystery, and so we'll often bring in other experts in a given field to express their opinion, to give a second opinion on what some other expert may have given in a report. And that's exactly what happened here. Dr. Weck went on TV and gave his opinion, and that opinion gave Rebecca's family a glimmer of hope. Dr. Weck said he wasn't sure at all that this was suicide, and he took it a step further and said that if he had done Rebecca's autopsy, he would have marked Rebecca's cause of death as undetermined. He elaborated that that meant there could be no firm answer on how Rebecca died until further investigations were done. Now, you need to know that Dr. Wecht, as I said, isn't just some random medical examiner. He is very well known. He has a reputation as one of the most prominent medical examiners in America. He estimates that he's done about 20,000 autopsies over the course of his career and supervised another 40,000. Dr. Wecht is a former president of the American Academy of Forensic Science, and he has been associated with many incredibly high-profile cases like John F. Kennedy, John Bonet Ramsey, and Anna Nicole Smith. So his opinion, even on a case he hadn't at the time done the autopsy for, definitely held some water. Now, medical examiners often work for the state or the county or the city, but they can also be hired privately. And when they're brought in privately, it is almost always to review what has been done. It's almost always to render a second opinion. And medical experts that do work for the city, state, or county expect to have their findings reviewed. And it's a really good check and balance system, quite frankly. They're used to getting second opinions rendered, so it causes them to be thorough, to check all the boxes, to dot all their I's, cross all their T's, to look at all the tissues, all the possible evidence. And like any medical expert, coroners can often interpret findings differently and render different opinions. And I've said before, autopsies do involve opinions, not facts, all the time. And that's because 
in addition to the science where they look at tissues and bones and what they find under their microscopes, they're also entitled to look at circumstances. And they render two different findings. One is cause, and this is cause of death, and this is found by examination. And it talks about the cause of death. It could be infection or cancer or an injury, for example. It's what was the cause. But then they render an opinion as to the manner of death. And there are five possibilities, five categories that they have to fit their findings into. One is natural, one is homicide, another is suicide, another is accidental, and then the fifth is undetermined. And they are entitled to take into account circumstances when they're dealing with manner. Where was the body found? What was in the environment around them? Were there dangerous circumstances around them? Were there animals around? Was it cold out? What was going on environmentally? So they can look beyond the body and take into account where it was found. That's permissible. It's ethical. They're entitled to look at that, look at where it was found. If a body fell, they're entitled to look at the terrain. If it rolled down a hill, if it fell down a rocky cliff, they're entitled to consider where that body was found and what it may have impacted before it came to rest. Think about it. If a body fell down a rocky hill, that would explain injuries to different parts of the body as opposed to if it fell down a grassy hill. So that's an example of them being able to consider circumstances. Now, this is exactly what happened when Dr. Weck looked at the first autopsy performed on Rebecca by Dr. Lucas. He said he disagreed with Dr. Lucas' findings. Dr. Weck took it a step further and said from what he could see that, frankly, it seemed unlikely that Rebecca took her own life. The autopsy itself was thorough. I have no criticism of the actual physical performance of the postmortem examination. It's the findings that puzzle me and lead me to express grave and serious doubts about the conclusion that the manner of death was suicide. Aside from the fact that she was found naked with her hands tied behind her back. Dr. Weck pointed to unexplained head injuries that he did not believe supported the theory that Rebecca slipped a noose around her neck, threw herself over the balcony, and died from hanging. He didn't see any reason that a hanging death would cause subgaleal hemorrhages, which are hemorrhages on the undersurface of the scalp. You get those when your head hits something or is hit by something. The San Diego coroner explained those head injuries away by saying Rebecca could have hit branches as she dropped from the balcony. But Dr. Weck didn't think the impact of her scalp hitting bushes or branches would be enough to cause that kind of hemorrhage. He also pointed out that to hang yourself, you drop feet first. A body falling down wouldn't have bruises from branches on the top of the head. She didn't dive head first off this balcony. Now, you need to understand that medical examiners look at different planes and angles. Now, by that I mean, if you have an injury to the top of your head, they calculate where that blunt force came from. Did it come from the right side at a downward angle? And therefore you create a plane that force impacted the body. And if you have something that is a blunt force that comes up under the chin, that would be a different plane. So they look at the different planes at which the body is impacted for injuries that occur to the body. And then they look at the environment and see, is there any way that that body could have traveled to explain the injuries that are on the body? And that's where they look at the environment. And what Dr. Wecht is saying here is these hemorrhages that seem to have been created by blunt force 
were just simply not in a plane that would exist if you hung yourself by stepping off of a balcony and dropping feet first to hang yourself. He said, you just simply don't drop feet first and get impacts to the top of your head from bushes or branches. Dr. Weck undoubtedly looked at the location of the body and what type of objects there were for her to possibly hit. And frankly, there just weren't any good candidates that were substantial enough to explain the not one, not two, not three, but four impacts to her scalp that resulted in these hemorrhages. Dr. Weck said those head injuries alone could be the sign of a deadly struggle that the police simply claimed didn't exist. Those head injuries could point to foul play. He said, and I quote, The injuries on the head are clearly indication of some kind of blunt force trauma. So for someone to say there is no evidence whatsoever of any kind of a struggle is not correct. End quote. Dr. Weck believed those types of injuries, like the one that caused bleeding underneath Rebecca's scalp, would have occurred while she was still alive or in the minutes shortly after her death. So that supported Rebecca's family's theory of murder. Before she went over the balcony, according to Dr. Weck, it's highly likely someone hit her over the head hard with something. Dr. Weck also questioned why, according to Dr. Lucas' autopsy report, sticky tape residue was found on Rebecca's legs, but no tape or even pieces of tape were found inside the house. Police said Rebecca's feet were bound with rope, but her autopsy showed at some point she had tape on her ankles, and the sticky residue, when the tape was removed, was left behind. If Rebecca had used the tape to try and bind herself before switching to rope, then where was the discarded strip and where was the roll? It was nowhere to be found. It couldn't just grow legs and walk away. If Rebecca used it and then killed herself, someone would have had to get rid of it after she was already dead. Rebecca's first autopsy report says this about the tape. Quote, On the anterolateral mid-left shin, there is a 1 by 5 eighths inch gray piece of material and two smaller similar pieces just distal to it, measuring 1 quarter inch and 3 eighths inch. Then parenthetically it says this appears similar to tape residue. On the lateral distal right lower leg, there is a 1 and a quarter inch by 5 eighths inch area consisting of three horizontally oriented, parallel, somewhat evenly spaced areas of sticky, tan gray apparent tape residue. They are situated between 3 16 and 5 16 inch apart." End quote. It was also strange to note that during a 90-minute news briefing, investigators never mentioned any sort of tape or tape residue during their review of the evidence, saying only that Rebecca used rope to bind her hands and legs before hanging herself. Why was any mention of tape or tape residue omitted? Is it because they had no logical explanation for it? And because it didn't fit the narrative? Or is it possible they were withholding this piece of evidence for the public so they could use it in identifying a suspect if, in fact, they were able to identify one. Oftentimes, they don't give out all the details of a crime so they can determine whether someone who might be confessing is, in fact, legitimate. But, of course, even after they close the case, they never reveal this information. Dr. Weck's comments made a hell of an impact on Rebecca's family. Finally, someone with some clout was saying something that backed up the belief they had in their hearts. This wasn't an open and shut case of suicide. So they had their attorney reach out and contact Dr. Weck and ask him for his help. They asked him to perform a second autopsy on Rebecca's body and look deeper into what could have happened to her. Dr. Weck accepted the assignment. So as Rebecca's body made its way to Philadelphia, her family clung to the hope that a new coroner and a new autopsy would bring new answers. 
they put their faith in Dr. Sarah Wecht and hired him to perform the second exam. Now, clearly, it's unusual for a body to be exhumed, but it's not rare. Most of the time, autopsies are done, and the findings are considered conclusive, and they are not challenged. But exhumation is done more than you might think. And do you lose data when a body has been buried and decomposing for a period of time? Of course you do. But if a body has been well embalmed, at one year, you can expect that it will be pretty well preserved. And you still have tissue that can be tested, and a lot of data can be gathered or verified. At 10 years, there will be some soft tissue remaining and some facial tissue still remaining, for example. At 25 years, not much is going to be left in terms of soft tissue because fungus tends to eat it away. At 50 years, because of the moisture in the ground, you're probably going to be dealing with a skeleton. It will still show arthritis, bone tumors, breaks, bacteriological infections, things of that nature. But across time, there is a deterioration through decompensation. This had been three months. And as I said, if a body has been well embalmed, at one year, it is still well preserved. This had only been three months. So Rebecca's body arrived in Philadelphia, and Dr. Weck completed his examination. You want to make sure that you consider everything that is available, uh, which is relevant uh, regarding these ultimate determinations of cause and manner of death. The body lies in a normal state of supine repose. Scattered superficial abrasions on her back and legs appeared consistent with impact with large plants. The hands, fingers, and fingernails uh, show no injuries. No rib fractures are noted, uh, period. There are no fractures of the sternum, period. And when he was done, he was able to officially say that he had serious doubts that this was a suicide. While I am not prepared to unequivocally with absolute scientific certainty say that it was a homicide and that it was not a suicide, I lean very strongly toward it being a homicide, something involving foul play, and I lean very strongly against it being a suicide. Dr. Weck's official determination was that Rebecca's cause of death was asphyxiation due to hanging, and her manner of death was undetermined. He said he was strongly leaning toward Rebecca's death being a homicide, not a suicide. He eventually came all the way around, and by the time this case went to a wrongful death trial, Dr. Weck testified in a San Diego Superior Court that it was his opinion that Rebecca Zahau's death was in fact a homicide, and that, quote, she was manually strangled, and it was set up to look like a suicidal hanging, close quotes. But he started out with ruling the cause of death undetermined. Weck based his conclusion on several things. The first was the presence of those four hemorrhages on the right side of Rebecca's scalp. Dr. Jonathan Lucas, who performed the initial autopsy, had previously called those wounds relatively minor. Dr. Weck disagreed. He determined the injuries could have possibly been caused by Rebecca being bludgeoned with a hard, rounded object. I have yet to hear from the law enforcement uh, in individuals involved how you get four separate subscalpular hemorrhages on the top of your head from a vertical hanging. You have to have blunt force trauma, you have to have the head impacting against some object four times or be struck by something four times of a rounded blunt force nature so as not to produce lacerations of the scalp. That connotes that there was sufficient force that went into the intracranial cavity and that means that you could have had a concussion and when you have a concussion you might have unconsciousness and when you get to the question of gee, there's no evidence of a struggle and so on. Yeah, if someone is immobilized in that fashion, that can explain that. Not every concussion leads to unconsciousness, but many do. And so that could well explain why you have Miss Sehau dead in this situation, this scenario, with no evidence of a physical struggle. 
Dr. Weck also said that a fractured band of cartilage in Rebecca's neck wouldn't have been injured as a result of a hanging death, but it could have been fractured if she was strangled. There were other injuries to the muscles and skin of her neck that also suggested to him that someone might have used their hands to strangle her. Dr. Weck also questioned how Rebecca's neck remained unbroken despite falling nine feet from the balcony. I believe that if the body had just plummeted down with that sheer drop of several feet, then the cervical vertebrae would have been fractured or dislocated, separated uh, one from the other or from the base of the skull. And that was not present as found in the original autopsy, nor by me. But if you have a body that plummets dead weight down, and that's the old-fashioned hanging, the reason it was done was to break the neck to ensure that the person did not suffer. We have no fractures of the cervical vertebrae. The skull is not disarticulated from the atlas, the first cervical vertebra. And that bothers me greatly with this kind of a situation. It cries out for an explanation. The doctor also noted several other injuries, like a bruise between Rebecca's rib cage that he thought could be an indication there was a struggle. And even though they weren't medical matters, based on the thousands of cases he had seen in his life, he had to question the strange circumstances surrounding Rebecca's death. I have a very serious question when I think about the 3,000, 3,500 suicides that I have done or examined in the 17,000 autopsies I've performed and the 37,000 other autopsies I have reviewed um, or supervised. How does somebody go about binding the hands in a slipknot arrangement, binding their calves, putting a uh, rope around their neck, then the shirt over the rope three times and stuffing it in their mouth. Now the idea that, well, somebody could do this, yes, I know, Harry Houdini did slip knots and things of that uh, nature 70 years ago. But to say that uh, Mez Zahao was able to do it, I've yet to hear from the law enforcement people, where did she acquire this skill? I'll give you a million dollars, hypothetically, if you show me how you can slip your hands in and out of a knot. So she accomplishes all of this, and then she gets up with her five foot four inch frame on top of a 36 inch balcony, and she plummets offward off that balcony, and she does so nude. In all of my autopsies, I can't remember a case where a woman commits suicide nude in an outdoor environment. Women just do not do these things. But still, much to Rebecca's family's dismay, despite this new professional opinion, police stuck firm with their ruling that this was a suicide, not murder. I have to say, it is difficult to get an initial body, whether it's a court or a medical examiner or a police department, to change their initial position. Because when you think about it, that requires them to publicly say, we blew it. We were wrong. And therefore, we've wasted time and put this family through unnecessary pain and turmoil. And we now publicly admit that we're going to change our position. So when you appeal something to a court, for example, and you're appealing to the judge that made the original ruling, you've got an uphill battle in getting that judge to overrule themselves. It's just human nature. The same thing is true with a police department or a medical examiner. That was, of course, a tough pill for Rebecca's family to swallow. It hadn't been an easy decision to exhume her body, and of course it took an emotional toll on everyone. But they knew in their hearts it had to be done, and even if they didn't have a new ruling, they now at least had a reputable person saying, that what they believed wasn't completely crazy. It wasn't just them who felt that way. You have to ask, was Dr. Wecht completely objective, or was he influenced by knowing what the family wanted to hear? Well, if you have at all followed Dr. Wecht's career, you discount that pretty quickly. He's not much for telling people what they want to hear. He's about science. He's about findings. 
and he will give you his findings, and he will tell you why. He will back it up. And Rebecca's family clung to Dr. Weck's findings, as well as evidence found on a large knife in the guest bedroom. The attorney representing Rebecca's family reveals Rebecca's blood was found on the handle of that knife, but her fingerprints were not, and that blood was menstrual blood. Rebecca was on her period when she died, and he believed that evidence showed someone sexually assaulted her with the handle of that knife. Now, I know that is a lot to hear, but why and how else would that blood get there? If for some reason Rebecca was in a state of psychosis and did that to herself, why wouldn't her prints be on the knife? It's not something I'm sure any woman could imagine doing under any circumstances, but it is something you sometimes see in rape cases. When you see a rapist do this to an individual, to rape them with an object, you're dealing with a high degree of rage, a high degree of depersonalization. And we have to remember that rape is not about sex, it's about power. It's about exerting power and control over an individual. And when the violence gets to the point of assaulting that individual with a foreign object, then boundaries have been crossed that reflect a degree of rage and a lack of control that identifies an individual that is of the worst nature. This is the kind of person that does not have control, doesn't have an edit button, is not able to pump the brake with their rage and disdain for women or the individual that they are aggressing against. So at this point, with all the things I've been talking about, you're probably asking yourself, why are the police turning a blind eye to this? This seems to be making a really good case for murder. So what is it the police are looking at that outweighs this evidence? We've been talking about tape residue that indicates there was tape, but yet it obviously was pulled off. So where is the tape that was pulled off? Where is the roll that it came from? We have this knife that has her menstrual blood on it, but no fingerprints, and certainly not her fingerprints, so it had to have been wiped clean. So you're saying it just doesn't seem like a suicide, so what is it they're looking at? Well, there were some things they were looking at. One of the main pieces of evidence that the police were hanging their hats on were notes written by Rebecca before she died. They were found on her phone. It appears she was using the notes section of her phone almost like a diary, typing out her thoughts. And there were certain notes in particular that police found that painted a picture of a very unhappy woman. She has been described as a young, beautiful woman that seemingly had it all. Beautiful mansion, beautiful location, young, healthy, vibrant, But things are not always as they seem. These notes painted a picture of a very unhappy woman, a woman who just may have felt desperate enough to consider taking her own life, and something like Max's tragic accident could have tipped her over the edge. The police posted these notes on their website almost as if to say, see, she was suicidal. Here are some of the things she wrote. And these are quotes taken from these notes. If I'm not thinking, I am crying. No amount of money is worth what I'm going through. Being talked to like I'm a worthless person by kids who are spoilt. Am I just too much of a coward to face the truth that I'm settling for the hope of a few happy years, which may never even come? Am I pretending I will be content without ever having a child? Is it my own fault I have allowed myself to be completely cut off from my own life? My life does not exist. Those quotes are not consistent with appearances. Those notes do paint a different picture of Rebecca. 
But Rebecca's family still says, no way, not a suicide. There's not a chance that she took her own life. They just don't see it. Was Rebecca a woman who hid her sorrows? Maybe her family just didn't know she was so miserable in her life with Jonah. And clearly, some people like to keep up appearances. Some people don't open up to their loved ones because they're embarrassed. Maybe family members had cautioned her about abandoning her life and her career and moving in and becoming dependent on a man. And she didn't want to hear, I told you so. And so she maybe hides this. Who knows? And I read these notes, and clearly there is a degree of of despair. But I have to say, I pay attention to what isn't there. There is no reference to ending her life. There is no reference to saying, I've had it. Nowhere in there does she say enough is enough and too much is too much and I am at the end of what I can cope with. She's taking her own inventory. She's being self-critical. But this is a huge leap from the content of these notes to saying someone is at a point of taking their own life. Remember, I ask you to take yourself to that point. That is a big, big step. And Rebecca's sister Mary says she did know Rebecca was unhappy. But she says Rebecca wasn't considering killing herself. She was just considering breaking up with Jonah. Mary says her sister was sick of being treated like a nanny and a chauffeur for his children. And despite the appearance that Rebecca lived a pampered life, that actually wasn't the case. And Rebecca felt more like a glorified housekeeper and babysitter than a valued girlfriend. After one family visit where Mary says Rebecca was using serious elbow grease to clean moldy parts of the glamorous mansion she lived in, her sister says Rebecca finally let her guard down a bit and admitted to Mary she wasn't sure how much longer she could handle the relationship, the kids, the stress of ex-wives, all of it, and was considering leaving But despite that, Mary is adamant she meant moving away, not leaving by way of taking her own life. To Rebecca's family, these notes left behind prove nothing. Nothing except the fact that if you compare how she wrote the sinister message painted on the bedroom door, she saved him, can he save her? They just don't seem similar to the way she expressed herself in these notes. And so they pushed forward with their wrongful death lawsuit, naming Adam Shacknai as Rebecca's killer. To them, Dr. Weck's findings, coupled with the blood on the knife, supported their theory that Adam had taken the opportunity when the mansion was quiet and they were alone, as everyone else sat vigil at the hospital, to sexually assault his brother's girlfriend, murder her, throw her over the balcony, and cover up his tracks. And despite Adam's insistence that he was not a killer, despite police saying only her feet were on that balcony and only her prints and DNA were in the room, finally someone listened. Seven years after Rebecca Zahau's death, her family's wrongful death case came before a jury of 12 men and women who would decide once and for all what they thought really happened to Rebecca Zahal before police found her naked and bound, silenced on the grass of the lavish Spreckles mansion. But no matter what the findings, no one would go to prison over Rebecca's death. This was only a civil case. What, if any answers, did the trial bring? And now, eight years after her death, will Rebecca ever rest in peace? We're going to find out in the final episode of Mansion of Secrets, The Mysterious Death of Rebecca Zahal. I'm Dr. Phil. 